a entrepreneur is just doesn't land the plane. They love the first 10 minutes. They don't do the rest. And you have to absolutely be willing to suck, which if you've been told how smart you are your whole life is going to feel counter to your value structure. You have to dissolve the notion of being great and fall in love with the, I'm the type of guy who is gritty and gets through stuff because then you'll get to great. And the people who are entrepreneurs just never get through that boundary and don't live in the suck. That Entrepreneur Show, we are back, and I'm excited to bring the owner of Andolini's Pizza to the show, Mr. Mike. Thank you so much for taking some time to join our community. Hey, thank you for having me. I very much appreciate it. Oh, I'm excited to dive into a lot today, folks. What are most businesses doing wrong? What were some of his failures, lessons learned along the way to help other people avoid them too, and everything in between? But if this is your first time joining us, I have to welcome you to That Entrepreneur Show. This is a community of people who give back through their stories, through their experiences to help you succeed in this lonely journey of entrepreneurship. We have a lot of good stuff ahead, as I said before, some cool talking points, but I want to show him some love. His pizzeria was a top 10 in America. That's freaking sweet, man. Congratulations. Thank you. We we appreciate it. You know, it, it just kind of happened. We didn't like plan for that. It was uh, It was cool. Well, there's a lot that happens between starting your company and finally hitting this top 10. I know you weren't chasing it, but hard work does get rewarded. When you were first starting out, what were some of your bigger pain points? You know, when you, especially in a restaurant game, you start, there's no workflows that are predetermined. There's no one who's like, hey, this is how you do it. Even if you've worked another restaurant, starting one is a completely different beast. Even if you have recipe cards at another place you got to build them all new there's so many i think that's a part of the reason why the failure rate is so high there's really no like oh well if you're going to start that type of business just follow this protocol because there's not one i put that right here in the show notes why working in the restaurant is different than owning as many entrepreneurs have in their side hustles along the way is that hospitality work, right? Where I also find you gain a lot of valuable skills in hospitality, interacting with people in different backgrounds being a big one. Yeah. What are some of the biggest things you take away that you can carry over to other parts of your life you've learned in this grind? And I say grind because I know the hard work that goes into those late nights. I mean, the interesting thing about restaurant ownership is to be good at it, you have to be good at everything. Like I'll take any really solid restaurant entrepreneur and they could easily have a marketing firm, easily, because there's so much to it. You have to be tech savvy. You have to have numbers up the wazoo. You have to be a life coach because you're dealing with so many different personalities, whether they're high school kids or 45-year-olds, you know, motivational speaker. And the food becomes like the obvious thing, but that's just the price of entry. Impeccable food is just the ticket into the door and that everything else takes hold. When you talk about a guest coming into your restaurant, you said there are other things that take fold. We want to make sure that guest is having a good experience, right? What are some yeah. things that you do? Well, obviously, of course, it may not translate to fine dining or something, but for your style of restaurant, what are some things you do to go above and beyond? Well, we, you know, I have a fine dining restaurant. I have 12 restaurants, so it does... I've learned that there are certain things that work across the board. And it's the, the main thing is, are we a check the box restaurant or are we, uh, oh my God, you got a restaurant. And the difference is everything in, in every town, you're going to have that new restaurant. Like, oh, have you been there? Oh, we should go. And that's the check the box. Once they've checked that box, are we going back? And you could do everything right we filled up the waters. We got them their order on time. We brought the check. Doesn't matter because if it's not an impressive experience, if it's not over the top, they're not going back next week because the people that they're with for next week are like, oh, you want to go to that restaurant? No, we went there last week. So you can't just exist in checking the box. It has to be this, oh my God, they did this and 
have you had it? Oh, I'm going to take you there because that place is. And if you can't be that, if you can't be impressive, then by default, you're unimpressive. And you might as well have been horrible because if both of those horrible and just okay, they're not going back. And that's so well said, putting yourself in the consumer shoes, right? When I go out to eat, what do the places do differently that make me want to go back? You mentioned fine dining and some pizzerias. I want to show some love to all you have going on. Let's talk about all your restaurants. I have five Andalini's pizzerias, full-blown pizzeria brick and mortars. Then I have a food truck. We have two food hall locations. One is a different, like a chicken and wing pizza place, and then also um, a cheesesteak shop. Then I have our food hall. Or I, then I have our airport location, rather. And then our fine dining restaurant known as Prossimo Restaurante, which is all fresh pasta, super experience driven, uh, average ticket of around $150. After that, uh, we have a Mexican restaurant uh, called Dos Ponchos that's under our umbrella with a different, you know, one of our former uh, head of prep took that over and we support him and his growth. Additionally, we have a catering arm and our food truck. So 12 different things, seven brands, and it's all owned by my brother and I here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So many questions based off that. I love how you're inspiring everybody to think big, grow under their umbrella. Which food choice is your favorite to run? Like which, which situation is your favorite? If you had to go back and be, say, a manager, <laughs> you were in the heat, in the chaos. Where do you want I mean, to be? I, pizza is my thing. Uh, I still, you know, love to toss dough. Now it's like that's what I could do for my fun of the day is – tossing dough like i enjoy it but all of it's great like i love food i love the experience but to grow a business it has to be methodical and that's a big thing i'm a you know for a long time was is the food incredible which we've learned has to be but it can't stop there which i see so often is the problem there's like four pillars holding up this bridge the food the ops the marketing, the financials. And so many times restaurants are having, oh, everything's not going great. Great, more food. Make more food items. Be better at food instead of marketing ops or financials. Love how you're shedding some light here on overlooked areas. And I can certainly see why the shiny object must be food. We're in a restaurant, food, food, food. But I think that's where experience comes in from someone like you. I want to go back in time a bit. I don't think you woke up one day and just, maybe you did actually, maybe you did wake up one day and say, Hey, I'm going to open a freaking pizzeria. What was your childhood like, or what formed you to be this food connoisseur? I mean, when people say, did you always like pizza? I'm like, it's not a high bar. I have a soul. You do too. <laughs> I have a very interesting and different story in that I was on my way to becoming a JAG lawyer, like JAG, the TV show, a Marine Corps lawyer. I went to officer candidate school, which is not enlisted, but you do in the summers of college. I did the training, found out I had type 1 juvenile diabetes. So now I would not have law school paid for by the Marine Corps, but I still plan to go. I went to law school for a solid ass 90 minutes and said no. After being accepted, I went to orientation like that. And this isn't it. At that same exact day, my brother got uh, notice that he was going to be transferring with Al Morentkar, and he was vice president to Tulsa, Oklahoma. So we had lived in New York and California. He was getting transferred from Florida to Tulsa. And he's like, hey, you just like want to take this bonus and start a family business? And I took the very little time I had worked at pizza restaurant and the very you know, year and a half I had worked fine dining in San Francisco and said, sure. And I opened a restaurant at 22. I don't suggest that. That's not a good like bar, but here's the difference. Uh, talent is kind of worthless. It's really drive. And if someone was saying to me, well, hey, you know, restaurant's hard. Are you going to be able to pull this off? It's a lot of long hours. I just come off OCS and sleep deprivation and putting myself through the ringer with type one juvenile diabetes getting down to 130 pounds. So the thought of a challenge wasn't the hard part. It was really, okay. How much can I learn? How fast can I learn it and have no ego about it? And that's exactly what we did. I love that point, the no ego about it. I was someone who found myself 28 years old with an MBA starting my company, but still need to make an ends meet. 
that ego, that humility certainly comes when you're a 28 year old MBA grad now serving people again. I think yeah. that brings so much character into my formation as I grew. And I don't often credit it enough, but those experiences where you're at someone's call, I think it shapes a lot. Super inspirational, man. And it's great to see how you overcame a health scare. Everybody knows on this show, my health scare was a traumatic brain injury. Certainly pivoted my life in a way that I didn't foresee. And it seems like you haven't looked back. Now, if you could tell your 22-year-old self something when you started this restaurant up, what would you tell yourself? You know, the best lesson I've heard or have learned in like only the last two years is to be more interested than interesting and being interested in the customer's feedback and listening to staff has really catapulted success because a lot of the time I was like trying to out talk the situation and listening to employees is really, really solid way to move forward without even doing anything. It sounds too easy, yeah. but you know, you decompress an employee by listening to them. You hear out a customer, you'll really find the path as opposed to relentlessly guessing and saying, you'll follow what I tell you because I'm going to come up with a great idea and then pivoting, 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 which is exactly what I did. And I did it enough that it worked, but it was a big ass game of pin the tail on the donkey that I could have avoided. Yes, strategy, as we all learn, we're excited, we're entrepreneurs, we're out there, we're getting it, but oftentimes the self-reflection and the overall reflection can be the biggest key to success. Everyone, he's out here sharing right now how the missing piece was right in front of him, just talking to people, hearing out what they say. When you're going for customer feedback, do you rely on like Yelp reviews, Google reviews, or do you have something implemented to follow up maybe? We have multiple. So obviously the review score, Google being the one we we believe the most. Then we have a program, a, a great app called Ovation that works to send out reviews after the order. If someone likes us, it sends them to do a Google Yelp review. If they don't like it, it sends them into a feedback text message with our management team. So Love that's it. review incentivization and loss prevention simultaneously. Additional we have our own secret shopper program. We used to pay for a service and then we're like, we have enough friends. Let's just tell them what we want. They send in reviews with detailed audits. Uh, we also have from our staff, a whole eval schedule that we built just on Google forms to nice. see what they're feeling. And it's not ever done. Also, it's the quality of the questions. It's the environment that those questions are asked. So they have to feel true safety in saying anything about what's happening so they're the ones who hit enter on the review on the survey the staff is being evaluated by a manager they're the ones who have the last say to write whatever they want and hit enter so it's completely it's never going to be um censored i love that because if it is you're not going to get the feedback you want it's just molding it to what you want to hear maybe but that exactly. of course doesn't do us very good We've showed a lot of love on your stuff, but you have so much more to offer. Everyone, I know I teased the talking points in the beginning, but now we're going to get to them. I know you probably touched on a lot of this as we went along, but what are most businesses doing wrong? You touched on a few points. What are some yeah. other areas we can combine in here? So many businesses try to so desperately to fit in, to look like the other guy, because that guy looks professional. Now, I'm not, I'm saying mimic their structure, mimic their technological awareness, but then in messaging, in brand, in offering, be vastly different, be vastly yourself. And that assumes that you're like interesting and likable, but most people underplay that and they don't want to. I, I see, and just in pizza alone, how many New York pizza do you see across America? And I'm like, are you from New York? And they're like, well, no. It's like, okay, you're doing a New York style pizza place, but you love NASCAR or you're a former lawyer. Like lean into that. Do a NASCAR pizzeria. I haven't seen that yet. Do that because that's unique. Oh. That's different. Stop trying to be this thing that we've all seen that you're not even doing it the best version of. Everyone, he's saying without your UVP, your unique value prop, chances are you're going to be battling upstream. 
even with my podcast production company, there are a whole bunch, but I'm actually, from what I've found, the only one run by an actual podcaster, similar to yeah. what you're saying. They may be a great camera person or a, a photography company branching out, but none of the other companies have people that failed in the industry, had no budget, no money as a solopreneur, had to learn the whole process and teach it to myself. And now I help other people avoid that pitfall. So glad I asked that question. Now, another one I was excited to talk about, the entrepreneur and entrepreneur. We all have ambitions out there. Many of us fall into that earlier category, but I would love your take from someone that's so successful. A entrepreneur is just doesn't land the plane. They love the first 10 minutes. They don't do the rest. And you have to absolutely be willing to suck, which if you've been told how smart you are your whole life is going to feel counter to your value structure. You have to dissolve the notion of being great and fall in love with the, I'm the type of guy who is gritty and gets through stuff because then you'll get to great. And the people who are entrepreneurs just never get through that boundary and don't live in the suck long enough. If you could do that, then you'll be through it. Now, minimizing the suck is all about whether you can pay for smart advice, smart systems, not just consultants who tell you more of what you already know, but really able to take it on. A lot of people could just buy something. It's, can you now do it? And if you can, that goes back to humility. The ego is going to be like, okay, I got it. I already got it. This is, uh, I got it. Or this is dumb. Or why do I, uh, I think I, no, come on. It's really just owning your suckage to be a great entrepreneur. Everyone out there, you are going to, depending on what your definition of suck is, in my definition, I sucked for a long time. It wasn't because I wasn't giving the effort. If I weren't giving effort, I would have been that big stat of 95% of businesses or whatever don't go past year two. You got to surround yourself with the right people. Like you said, not telling you things that you already know or you want to hear. You need people who are going to push you, push you, get uncomfortable because if you're not uncomfortable, entrepreneurship just may not be for you. I struggled for many, I'm over the last two years, I'm finally starting to see this consistent revenue stream, I guess you could say. But for those first six years, I tried my best with trial and error and eventually strategized, got to put in an incubator program and worked out some of the kinks that I needed before we get to the fun question of which entrepreneur do you want to meet that you haven't met yet. He's got some books. He's a fellow writer out here. He's going to be on writing with authors. This show will, that show will already have aired by the time this one goes live. But in case you didn't catch that episode, this guy's a freaking bestseller. He's got top businesses. Let's talk a little bit about the books. Yeah. I wrote a book called uh, unsliced how to stay whole in the pizzeria industry. It's 90% business, 10% like restaurant yeah. stuff, but I did a, uh, position it. It is not like the story of me and a self-aggrandizing entrepreneurial book. It's a real ass book on Amazon, Audible, uh, audiobook, all that. I wrote it with no angle. Um, I finished it right at COVID and the, the forward in it is the first week of COVID. And it's everything about how to get employees to have buy-in, how to organize the structure of a restaurant, how to uh, get customers to want to dig you, how to work with vendors in a smart way. There's, it's all that in a book. It has a soundtrack. I'm very proud of the book. And then yeah. I got with all of my pizza friends. We had the world's most authored pizza book that we did here in Tulsa. All the photos here and all the money goes to benefit Make-A-Wish. And it's a real ass number one on Amazon culinary book called The Pursuit of Pizza. So if you are a home chef who loves making pizza, this is an advanced book in pizza making. I love that. Everyone, he's digging into something he said before, being authentic into yourself, doing what's you, putting out these books of his passion, his expertise. I think the book came out at a good time, coincidentally, coming out right before COVID because you were resonating with a lot of business owners. I'm going to have to ask, of course, everyone listening on is going to want to hear something about COVID now. What was it like in Tulsa, Oklahoma during the initial COVID strike or whatever, that March period? The first week for everyone was gnarly because there was people look back on it now. I don't think people really like, we didn't know if zombies were coming out the, around the corner for that first week. Like when people saw bodies getting stacked in New York, the whole world was like, Oh crap, what are we doing? And yeah. is the government going to save us? I have no idea. We got to close. Is it martial law? 
first week was scary. We went from shutting everything down to by that Sunday needing to call in for more food because we were selling our ass off. So it was this mass. And we, that first day of COVID, went to shutting off, coming up with the idea of a pizza kit for people to use at home and taking what I would normally do as a 60-day buildup and doing it in two hours. Like, here's a photo. Here's a video. Here's how we're going to do an email blast on it here set teaching staff how to do it with like a text stream to all our staff and creating a pizza kit within like two hours and a whole new product. So it tested all of our systems, but they all came together simultaneously. And that week went from being scary to a, a massive highlight of our career. I love how you thought outside the box and didn't let it affect you. You saw the need for people still needing to eat, still wanting to do it at home or to go orders, whatever. That was really sweet. That's a pretty cool idea. Now, before we get the contact info, before where we know to hide this book and all these things about our guest of honor, if you could choose any entrepreneur throughout history, Mike, dead or alive, oh. and this could be at any point of your life. It doesn't have to be at this moment right now. It could be at any point of your journey. There's so many interesting ones over time. Henry Ford, yes. it would be super interesting. Rockefeller, Rockefeller was so advanced and that he was doing a Rolodex of contact cards so he could really engage with people. Like before there were CRMs, he intrinsically knew to do that. So I think he would be a super interesting guy to talk to. And then today, the person who's putting out the most content with it backed up and in a very just no frills, but with a lot of frills is Hermosi. I think we're living in the time of a very, very interesting conceptual entrepreneur that how much he's putting out there. And I think Alex Hermosi will be looked upon in the future as very prolific. Can't argue with either choice. And I truly love when guests bring on Titans of Industries back in the day. We didn't have Google to hop on. Great example. I actually did not know that about the CRM before the CRM. I tell everyone, no matter who you're speaking with, even if you know what their journey is, I know all about his stuff, how many things I learned today, countless. So I thank you so much, Mike, for connecting all the way from Oklahoma to here in St. Pete, Florida. Now, where can we find you online, the book, all things Mike? For sure. If you just dig what I got to give, go to at Mikey Bausch on Instagram. You can check out what Andalini's Worldwide is at, at, or at andaliniesworldwide.com. And if you are a restaurateur looking to take it up a notch, go to getunslice.com to see what I do. Thank you for sharing all that, everyone, especially if you were in that area, go check out his pizza. It is backed by countless awards and all of his other restaurants. You can even do a weekend in Tulsa and check out all of his different offerings. But with that, the show is at That Entrepreneur Show on all podcast platforms. Remember to subscribe if you enjoyed today's awesome show. We're on social media at the same. And I, my name is Vincent A. Lancey. I'm on all social media and YouTube at that. And you will find there a few weeks after this show comes out, some video clips from today. The show is brought to you by Coming Alive Podcast Production, your number one stop for podcasting needs. Head to po comingalivepodcastproduction.com to learn more. But with that, we're signing off today. Thank you so much, Mike, for taking the time to join our community. Right on. Thank you. Thank you.